Right, welcome back. So the next session is, uh, we've, we've called it logistics, um, and we have a panel of five people here today who can hopefully help you through that quagmire. So um, a couple of them are already sitting here because they wanted to get to the head of the queue at Dover, so they're already here. Um, and uh, so you, you know Tom, um, um, and um, the person sitting next to him, uh, I'll introduce him while he's there, that's Tim Ridyard, he's from Ashton's Legal, um, but focuses and specializes on transport and freight. Also on our panel, we have John Lucy from the Freight and Transport Association. Welcome, John. We have Peter Bishop from the London Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, Peter. And we also have Les Hall from Velta. So a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of you will know Les and know of Velta. So I'll ask them to give a, a brief introduction, and then we'll, we'll crack on with the questions. So I'm going to start with... Um, John, if I may, would you like to go first? Hi. Morning, everyone. So, in case you don't know, the Freight Transport Association is uh, probably the, the fourth largest business organization in the UK. We represent some 18,000 members from the logistics industry, not just the providers of logistics services, but also the buyers of the logistics services. So our members are the, uh, tend to be the large fleets, also ports and uh, airports. Um, Basically, the, um, large, most of the large retailers tend to be our members. We have a real, um, oh, we believe we've probably got one of the best handles on what's going on in terms of the end-to-end -end supply chains and the, and the consequences, particularly of an no-deal Brexit, and we've been doing a lot of work with uh, various government departments for the last 12 months on this now. Um, this is ramped up now. We're doing lots of, uh, we're doing 20 uh, haulier workshops per week, and we're now changed, uh, evolved that into uh, shippers workshops, which we just started in Northern Ireland which is obviously a huge problem. For the logistics sector, we recognize there's four impact areas, really. Um, one is the regulations. Last time we had customs on, on freight moving across the channel, it was 1993. Then there was over 100 agents in Dover. Now there's five. Every type of freight that's gonna be moving across the water, and now obviously in the Irish Sea also, there's gonna be customs regulations. So be under no illusion, if you are leaving the UK to go into mainland Europe or now into the island of Ireland, there will be customs requirements. You will have to have documentation. If you haven't got arrangements in place now, it's highly unlikely you're going to be able to do something before next Thursday. The infrastructure I and mean, the capacity within the freight forwarding and the uh, customs agency is just not there anymore. In terms of cost, I mentioned that before, approximately 13 billion cost in declarations alone is HMRC's estimate for the UK economy. So there's a, there's a big... Um, looming issue in costs alone, and this isn't taking into account in delays, and uh, by the way, Operation Brock starts on Monday. There's, uh, I'm sure you've all heard headline figures, there's 10,000 vehicles a day crossing the Dover Straits. Operation Brock is going to cater for 11,600 of those. Um, and the delays aren't for vehicles coming into the country, these are vehicles backed up from Calais. Uh, just to put some flavour onto that, a couple of weeks ago we'd done the first trial with uh, the FDS ferries into Dover Calais with 100 um, guinea pig drivers, if you like, on that ferry. We arrived at Calais with the correct customs procedures. It, this is basically a demonstration to see how it works on a day. And in my, uh, my fictitious load, my fictitious lorry, it took me two and a half hours to, to, from arriving to leaving Calais. And that was holding area of 100 vehicles with an um, initial holding area of 100. So by my personal estimates, I would say, three hours of arrivals from the ferries, then the vehicles are backed up into Kent, and that's where Operation Brox comes into place. Well, thank you. Um, thanks, John. I will now ask Les if you would like to just give a brief introduction. Hello, uh, I'm Les Hall. I'm the general manager at Velta. Many of you know us from our long association with the MIA and Plaza as a freight forwarding agent um, and logistical provider. I've worked in the freight industry since 1975, so some 18 years before the single market um, produced a, a frictionless and borderless trade between the UK and, and Europe. So I've been there, done it. We know what's going to happen. Um, facilitating that is going to be difficult, but there will be a way. I'm a little bit more optimistic about the possibilities of being able to achieve the clearance procedures on both sides of the border as long as you're prepared. And being prepared 
is what you need to be. ERI numbers, packing lists, invoices, possible declarations or certificates of origin, things that you can talk to the Chamber of Commerce about, you can talk to about with your carriers, um, your chosen carriers at the moment. Th there are lots of things that you can do to make this transition that much easier. Um, earlier on, it was mentioned that if we do leave somewhere between now and the 31st of January, we don't actually leave until the 31st of December or up to two years later, Tom said, it could be three years from the 1st of January this year, and it could be. Nothing will change in that transition period. So as long as this withdrawal agreement bill is ratified by Parliament, you've not got to worry too much immediately. But being prepared is what you really need to do and talk to, gentlemen asked for um, virtually, not free information, but cheaper information where you can go. Talk to your carriers. They should be able to assist you in every way they can. That would be my advice. Uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask uh, Peter um, Bishop from the London Chamber of Commerce to give a brief intro. Um, go ahead, Peter. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, yeah, Peter Bishop from the London Chamber. I'm actually the chief executive of the London Chamber, the interim one. Uh, I took over from a guy you may have heard, heard of, David Frost. David Frost, the EU Sherpa, the chief negotiator for the government in getting the withdrawal agreement changed, the Ter 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 Theresa May one changed, uh, and uh, what we've got now, good or, or bad. Um, so I've taken over from David. I was the deputy CEO uh, for many years be be before that, and my subject is international trade facilitation. I'm here specifically for the ATA Carne because I know many of you are users of, of that. The London Chamber of Commerce is the national guaranteeing or organization for the Carne in the UK. I chaired the International ATA Carne Council, so there are, there are 78 countries in the world that use Carnes. Um, 15 uh, million of them issued every year. Now that's wrong, but uh, lots of them. Um, so I know it from the other side too. We also issue certificates of origin, of course, and that will be uh, both preferential and non-pref, pref with the F F FTAs. And I'm sure uh, there'll be quest questions about that too. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait for that to uh, kind of react, Peter. Great, okay, thank you very much to you, Peter. And um, Tim, uh, would you like to give a brief intro? Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name's Tim Ridyard. Um, I'm a solicitor and a partner at, Ash at Ashton's Legal, 400 strong firm, East, uh, East Anglia based. Uh, I head up our regulatory team uh, and most of my work is spent looking after road transport operators, primarily in the area of operator licensing uh, and representing them in front of the regulator, the, uh, the traffic commissioner. Uh, and latterly my work has been, uh, in, some of my work has been involved in, um, in getting ducks in a row for, 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 for clients um, often in, in conjunction with trade association like the FTA, FTA uh, to ensure uh, a, a state of, uh, of readiness. Um, and I sense in this room, uh, most of you are not actual operators, but you are dependent on road transport, so need an awareness of the challenges facing the, the road transport sector uh, in, the, in, in the months uh, ahead. And following on from what was said previously in the last session, I think what I would say is ensure that you have all your customs and paperwork and information and documentation in place so that the haulier, the operator who's going to be transporting the music tours around Europe, whatever, have got everything they need for a seamless uh, movements um, throughout Europe. Um, and the problem is, for as, far as I see it, for, for the sector, um, at every stage you've got potential additional burdens at borders, that has knock-on effects with driver's hours, rules, and all this, on this kind of thing. Um, perhaps more training, perhaps more staff. I, I don't know if you've got to do wet stamping of carnets and you know, things like that, perhaps come back to, uh, to that later. Um, so there are a huge number of, uh, uh, of issues there that need to be thought through. And um, if you're aware of the problems 
that you'll hear about in this session uh, that are facing the transport sector, um, that, that will smooth things along for your business. There are all sorts of issues. There's operator licensing, um, uh, which is one of the, has been one of the big things. Obviously, you need an operator's license to operate uh, outside the UK. Um, there has been a deferment, even if, the, if there was, a, if there was a, a no deal Brexit in a week's time, there is a deferment. Uh, there are special uh, measures in place to allow international road transport operations now ratified by the European uh, Parliament this week until the 31st of July next year. So there is respite in that sense. Um, there are other things which I think we'll cover uh, uh, as we go along, in, in perhaps including the Operation Brock uh, that was mentioned at the end of the last session. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, we've already heard from Tom about his intro. We've strapped him to the chair until it's time for him to leave, so, um, which will be after lunch. Um, so there we are. We have some, obviously, we have a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge sitting in front of us. There must be some questions from, from the floor regarding transport, movement of people, movement of goods, there's got to be. There's one. We need a microphone. Hi, I'm Terry Sargent. I'm, I work for a German camera manufacturer. And um, we, my, my question's a logistics question. We run a sort of small store at the moment. We service cameras for, well, cameras that are manufactured in Munich, we service them. Um, what's, what's the likely implications um, on movement of goods after this? OK. I mean, obviously, we've, we've um, stocked up and we've um, bought a lot more stuff than we need, but that can't last forever. We're gonna, well, what sort of duties are we going to have? OK, could I... Um, Tim, would you like to go with that one is first? That, is that a duty, that's a duty question. Is that, could you deal with the... Yes, yeah, OK. Um, depending on the deal, if, if we stay within the EU, obviously nothing changes. If there's a free trade agreement, your duties coming into the UK will be, should be zero. If uh, there's a no deal, the government have suggested they're going to introduce a temporary tariff regime, which will zero out, I think uh, this was alerted to earlier, um, zero out 88% of products to a 0% a, a duty. Um, that's a temporary measure that will last for up to 12 months, possibly beyond. Going the other way, the UK becomes what the WTO or what Europe will, will regard as third country origin status. They will implement WTO rules immediately and our products coming from the UK into Europe will attract duties. The other thing that will change is VAT in the event of a no deal. A no deal, VAT will, should, I believe I'm right here, in saying return to or go back to postponed accounting procedures rather than upon arrival in the UK. If there's a trade deal, I'm afraid the same things will occur. If you trade or import from outside the EU at the moment, you're well aware of the procedures, read the same scenario from Europe if there's a no deal. China, America, Australia, Europe, it'll be exactly the same. And the temporary tariff regime that the government have intimated they will put in place will be throughout the world for all world trade. So if there's a deal, you shouldn't get any duties. If there's a no deal, you shouldn't for a temporary period. But if you're exporting your products to Europe, there will be duties, I'm afraid. Okay. Tom, any, any change on that or any update on that or is that actually is that is that absolutely up to date uh that's up to date the only thing i would say you, you said you know if there's a, a free trade agreement uh the caveat applies that that could take a while to negotiate um so uh yeah in the event of a deal uh that's true for as long as the implementation period uh that's agreed pending any free trade or future relationship agreement thereafter Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, there's quite a question here and there's a question about there. So. Just to confirm that with Tom, has the government confirmed that that 0% temporary regime will, will come into force? I'd have to check, but I believe so. It's up on the gov.uk website, which normally means if it's published on there, okay. it's live policy. 
Fine, thank you. Okay, there was a could, question. I, could I just add something to that? Yeah. It's only a draft document at the moment. Whilst the government have said they will implement it, it's still only a draft. It hasn't been uploaded to uh, the chief system, the custom system that we use. They can't do that yet, but it's, it's only a draft at the moment. Okay, we have a question coming from the back. Hello, I'm, I'm Stephen Page. I run a production design and rental company. Um, I've got three, three questions, really. The thing that we're interested in mainly is temporary importation and temporary movement of people and workers into, into Europe. But I have three quite basic questions. Um, firstly, is the worst case the equivalent of import or exporting equipment to the, somewhere like the UAE, where we're looking at, as you said before, EORI numbers, packing lists, etc., uh, etc. Et is that the worst case we're currently envisaging in terms of documentation? I believe that to be the case. Yeah. Okay. So you'll need export you've declarations. Good... You'll need import declarations. Yeah. Um, paperwork. It should be. Okay. So we're not anticipating worse than that. From a, docu from a documentation per Yeah. No. Okay, I'm happy about that then. Um, the other thing we do is that we're based in Manchester. Most of our freight would go through Hull or the, the non-channel ports. We don't really hear anything in the media about likely outcomes for goods and ser or goods going through non-channel ports. Is there, does anybody on the panel have a view as to how specifically non-channel ports might be affected, and are there, are there, um, is there anything in place to deal with delays at those ports? Yeah, yeah the Humberside ports are uh, the winners in Brexit, if you like. As uh, DFT has predicted, the freight movements from Dover will decrease by up to 60% in volume in the first six months in the no-deals uh, Brexit situation. So obviously the East Coast ports are going to pick up that uh, extra freight, which is obviously going to push its capacity to the limit. For Hull, there's um, there's a, like a mini operation block, if you like. The, the whole port is served by a dual carriageway straight through the main town, and they reckon that they've probably can, I think it's only a few hundred trucks they can hold within the port itself before the town backs up. And the concerns there is that the actual uh, crews for the for the vessels and for, you know for, for other vessels affected by this will not be able to actually get on the on on the ships, and the the, the port itself may become blocked inadvertently. And um, for Immigham, it's the same problem really. As the I think it's that's a half a mile of queues outside of the dock gates. It goes across the entrance to an oil refinery, and the concern is there obviously that although there's certainly going to be no fuel shortages as a result of Brexit, it's just. Uh, Indirect uh, traffic problems may, may cause, uh, you know, issues for the, for the delivery trucks coming in and out of the refinery. But this is, the processes are exactly the same. Whichever port you're going out of in the UK, it's the same. You still need customs declarations. There's, there's no uh, silver bullet in this. It, it's, it, it is what it is. Customs declarations will be required. Just a, an added point on the documents for the music industry, as well as the ATA carnage. Obviously, if you temporary import and export, which you, I'm sure you're going to be producing thousands more per year as a result of this. For the merchandise itself, there's a bit of an issue really for, for, for the, the trucking side of the industry because when you're taking out, I don't know, whatever the figures are, thousands of, of brochures or t-shirts and you bring them back, half of them or whatever the figure is, unsold, how do you get them back in? You, you, if they were all going to go out and come back again, you could do it on an ATA, I think I'm right in saying. But the issue is, what do you do with those, the return of the goods? And there's a, there's a big question mark on this. And, Worst, worst case scenario in a no deal situation, if, you, if you've got uh, a tour on tour right now and it's going to come back on the 1st of November and we, for some reason we do end up falling out next Thursday, there's going to be duties liable on, on, that, uh, on those goods coming back in and this, this, there's a, a sort of black hole of information about right? HMRC when it, if it goes to these sort of scenarios really, you know, there's lots of uh, operational details that really might uh, cause a lot of problems for the industry. Yeah, I, think the, I think the point was, does one need two sets of paperwork? Um, the ATA carne could the pure tour bid, uh, and then a second uh, set of paperwork um, uh, in relation to the to the merchandising, which is absolutely vital to the sector, as I understand it. Um, the other point I know that we may be coming to in due course is what uh, is also what happens if you're out on a tour 
and then Brexit happens. It's a long tour or something like that. And, uh, and, 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 w and what happens in terms of customs paperwork that we didn't need on the outbound, like, but you might need, you do on the inbound. What, what happens in that scenario? What we've got on our uh, website on the Carney issue about goods going out before a potential exit from the European Union and then coming back and we have left uh, is, the, is four scenarios that come into play depending on what kind of markets you're, you're uh, going to. I won't go through all four, but we have got the website address uh, link in the presentation that I sent over and no doubt you'll be sending that uh, yeah. around. Coming back to the uh, certificate of origin, just for a second, um, uh, absolutely, uh, the um, uh, certificates of origin will have a role to play there, there, thereafter. The format that we use now, uh, when I say thereafter, I mean in a no-deal uh, scenario, is an EU one. It's called the EU, in fact, it's called an EC certificate of origin. That won't be uh, pertinent, of course, but the the, the format that it's based on is Appendix C of the Kyoto uh, con, con, Convention, and so we've just uh, cut and pasted that as as the UK that is, uh, and that will be the uh, document used. So uh, that after the exit date actually happens, if it if it happens without a transition. Uh, then uh, the, that, that document is, has, has been pr prepared by the government and, and by the uh, chambers too. Did you have something to say on this talk? Yeah, so just on that, um, if, you, if someone is on tour um, and they leave before we sort of fall out of Europe without a deal and come back in having, you know, Britain having left that deal. Uh, the government advice on that is um, to provide a copy of an export declaration. Um, there will be a kind of uh, a period in the event of a no deal where border force will kind of be acting with a bit of discretion. So as long as you can prove with any paperwork that what you're bringing back into the UK came from the UK, uh, border force will act with discretion and take that in that scenario. Which is fine on the UK side, because obviously the HMRC has made a lot of unilateral decisions and waivers and easements throughout this whole process, but the vehicle's got to get to the UK in the first place, and if it hasn't got an export declaration from the EU, it will just not be allowed to embark. And that's, that's a big misunderstanding. There's, there's this idea that vehicles are going to be run around the UK and the continent without any declarations being carried out. From what I've seen or what we're seeing, there's just no way a vehicle's going to be allowed anywhere near a, a ferry to, to either go out or to come back in. So yes, that's a good easement, but it's still got to be able to arrive here in the first place. Okay, you had a, another question, I think. I, I think they're all covered, thanks. Okay. It's all good news, then. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. Um, okay, any more questions? There we go. Um, uh, Martin has a question. Hi, possibly a naive question. Who are you first? For a company Sorry. called PSAV now. We've got branches across the world. Um, when we currently transfer equipment across Europe with our German depots, Paris, and the like, we just ship equipment around willy-nilly and different bits will come back to those that go out on no particular time scale. We've got depots in the Middle East. I don't know from a naive point of view because I never thought to ask it. Everything we usually send to the Middle East is either temporary tour, so we know it's a three-day period, it's a five-day, a two-week period or something, or we t permanently put it there. When does a temporary carne become permanent, i.e. could we send stuff how, if it's still owned by the mother company, and of course we've got multiple trading limited companies across the world, when does it become an export as opposed to just being a long-term loan within the group? Well, Carne, by definition, is for one year. So if goods going out on a Carne must return within that, if they don't, then you pay the duty and the sales tax and a penal penalty as per the Istanbul Convention, which is, is the overarching convention for that re re regime. If you go out, um, take, take out a carne, uh, not knowing whether you're going to bring them back, well, you generally pay the, pay the price. Does that, is that 
the answer? Possibly. I, yes, I, I don't know. In that, yes, we've got stuff in Germany that's now contracted for four years. It will come back in four years' time, maybe. So yes, that we would have, have an issue of paying duty on our own equipment to bring it back into the UK. Yeah, well, four years, I mean, yeah, it's a long time, isn't it? So who knows? <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, any other questions? We had some other questions, where were they? So uh, we have a question at the back from Simon. Thank you. Um, hi, Simon Miller from Nutri Insurance with the, uh, with the Plaza's uh, in approved insurance supply. Um, it was just a quick comment, actually. Um, so in the event of a no Brexit deal, um, one consideration if you're taking your own vehicles across to Europe is that you will need the green card that used to be in play many, many years ago. And also the drivers will need the international driving license. Um, if there's a, a deal agreed, that, that won't apply. But if, if we do drop out, bit next week or in a few months time. Just be aware that insurers will need probably a five to seven day run up to get those green cards issued. And there might be a bit of a cost attached to it as well. I think some of the questions that, were, that, that we've been asked uh, is around um, when moving goods across Europe and they come from the UK and they, they, they go over to mainland Europe, because, they've, uh, because the origination of the, of the goods was in the UK, does that mean that each border that they go across, when in, in mainland Europe, do they have to go through other other customs? Will they be slowed down? In other words, or will they once they once they've got into mainland Europe, can they just freely travel around mainland Europe? Um, depends where you clear your goods. If you clear your goods at Calais on arrival, then they're free to travel throughout Europe because they're in free circulation the same as they would be if they came into the UK at the moment, free circulation. If you want to clear your goods at another border, the community transit uh, um, rules will, will return, and you can get a T-form that will enable you to move your goods freely until it reaches its destination, where the declarations, the customer's declarations can then be made. In reality, I believe most of them will be done in Calais. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Any further questions? There's a question at the back. Um, uh, Nina from Roscoe. Um, we sometimes um, receive an order, say, from Germany, and we ask a supplier in Spain to drop ship to Germany. How will that be affected? In terms of customs, you mean? Yeah. Well, it's, it's EU goods, so it doesn't really matter where it's coming from. It's, it's just EU goods, so the, the the country of origin, as far as you're concerned, it just needs an EU export declaration to be made and it will need to be imported into the UK. Will nobody want a tariff? Because we're being paid for the goods in the UK. Sorry, I didn't quite we're hear We're being that. paid for the goods in the UK. Will nobody want a tariff for movement of goods? Well, the tariff will depend on the type of goods. I mean, as we said before, this 88 percent of the imports for a temporary period will be tariff-free, so it depends what the type of goods are. OK, thank you. OK, anybody else? Oh, sorry, yeah. We sometimes, because our shipments are fairly small, we sometimes ship into uh, distributors in Europe for consolidation forward onto um, other parts out of the world outside of the EU. Um, obviously, it depends on what type of deal or no deal happens, but how would that comp be complicated with the forms that we'll have to fill in? T-form. Get a T-form. Your goods can then travel from the UK to their destination under bond, basically, and then when they're exported, the T form will be discharged by an export declaration from, say, Germany to the UAE or outside the EU. That's what the community transit regime's for. Okay, Matt. Hello, Matt Lloyd, 3LR Lighting. A uh, quick question for manuf manufacturers' warranties. We often have a five year warranty now, and Europe, of course, is a big trading partner. How does it work if I have a piece of equipment that breaks in a theatre in Italy? and I send out a bit of kit from UK at zero value, because it's replacing it, and bring back the faulty bit of kit. Is that all acceptable in the new regime? 
Yeah, that's not a sort of that, that's not a Carnet question. That's a customs regime question. So replace uh, return. Well, I mean, I'm not a customs expert. So. Well, it would, it would just be a, a UK export to the EU, and if, if they do need to come back at a future date, it will be a, an, e, a, an EU export to the UK. But would I have to transact any money or tax to in order to maintain my warranty service to my customer in Italy? Well, duties will be payable on, 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 the, on the import clearance of the goods anyway, so whenever it's imported, it's clear customs into Italy, for example, the, the local duties and VAT will be paid at that, that time. It be a zero value invoice. It'd be zero value because it's free replacement. Uh, UK exports are not zero rated. It's, it's EU imports into the UK. UK exports will fall under this uh, WTO tariff. So, sorry, so the value of the goods would be zero because it's a, it's a warranty repair? Would they recognise that in this situation? No, you, you'll need to have a value for customs purposes. Um, you could consider bringing the piece back to the UK under uh, another customs regime called Inward Process and Relief, where you can bring them in free of charges and re-export them free of charges, uh, duties and taxes, um, as if you're only bringing them in for repair. If you're sending a part out, I think as my colleague has said, you'll probably get charged for duties and taxes going into Europe, but the, it will require a value. So where do we find out that value? How can we confirm we're being legal? Take a chance. <laughs> okay. That, I, that, I'm afraid I can't tell you at this stage. I think it's a serious note, in the manufacturing, you put a warranty in for five years on products now, that's a potential significant cost if you have a product that starts to fail in Europe, if you have to pay tax on it. The, the, the temporary tariff uh, uh, list, for want of a better word, I think it's three volumes, has, has been launched now, so that's publicly available now, so you can check your value goods. And to, and to be fair, to do a, an, an export declaration anyway, you would need the origin, I believe. You would need the, the tariff value and so on and so on. So you wouldn't be able to do an export declaration without that, that information anyway. So as soon as you start moving things, you, you will discover that. Or make products that don't break down. Hello. Um, I'm Martin Waugh from Syntax Audio, and it's kind of following on from what the previous gentleman was just saying. Um, we represent various European manufactured products in the UK. I'm not going to bother about how I import them. I think I've got that bit covered. But um, we regularly consolidate repairs under warranty at our offices here. And about once a week, we send those repairs back to the factory in Germany where they are repaired. So it's, it's kind of the same question. Um, at the moment, I just send the goods. They get repaired. They come back to me. That's fine. In the future, will I have to make customs declarations and I used to send stuff to India for repair on one occasion, and the old trick of making a commercial invoice where everything's just valued at one dollar or, or one pound or whatever, so you end up having to pay a few pence or whatever, but is that, is that going to be acceptable in the future, do you think? Ha 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 ha, he's laughing. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the answer to that is something called outward processing relief and inward processing relief, which is designed for exactly what you're talking about. So if, if you uh, research that on HMRC. Trevor. Yeah, just to append to, to those responses, in Martin's question and this gentleman's question here from the, the lighting company, we again export to extra EU countries and in the event of warranty repairs, the inward processing relief occurs. The tip is to make sure you keep your records straight, neat and tidy. So invoices with serial numbers, all of the details of the shipping documents so that they can be matched to that invoice and that product. And that is the only way that you can bring things back in and send them back out again, duty and VAT free. That's our experiences so far. And that information is available on the government websites again, but it takes ages to find it. So asking Chambers of Commerce or, or your freight trader associations or even Velta, of course, have been very helpful to us as well to, to find that sort of information out. So just to be clear, if a customer has a broken bit of kit and I want, to I want to send them a replacement, I'm likely to have to pay something for that on tax and duty. If I ask them to send it back, I could get it for free. Could I just add something to that? If you've manufactured it in the UK and you're bringing it back, you can always bring it back as British return goods. Uh, in a similar vein, we, we manufacture a product, a bespoke product, goes out to a country. If it's manufactured wrong or we've made a mistake, we will then remake it and free issue it. The value of the goods 
isn't warranting bringing it back and then of no use to anyone else, so they're normally just binned. Have I got a charge even though the second lot will be zero value to my customer and it's only going one way? We would normally send it with a zero rated invoice. Would there be duty and, and tariffs applicable to that even though there's no commercial value to the transaction other yes. than negative to yes. myself? The answer is yes. Yes. Okay. It's because you have to do a customs declaration, so it, it doesn't matter to the UK revenue if there's no value to your customer. It's, it's you're making a declaration. Okay. Okay. We've got a few minutes left in this particular session. We have a, a, a question over here, uh, Duncan. Um, I just want to revisit with respect to let's talk about a tour's worth of equipment that's overseas and it's out there now. Um, and from what I understood earlier, there'll be some honeymoon period with respect to our local customs, but did I sense there was an issue on the other side that, that the truck gets to the port, and at that point, actually, it can't enter the UK? Was I correct in, in hearing that? Are you moving under ATA Carnet? Well, I guess that is what I'm talking about, because as of today, I've got equipment overseas that I haven't done a Carnet for, and it's coming back in 11 months' time. It's hypothetical as it turns out, but this is the question. Well, as Tom said, we believe there's uh, waivers on the UK side of it, but um, you, HMRC can't talk for the EU customs authorities. As a, a, that's the official advice. Yeah. So the ruling, and this has been, everyone in the sector is asking this question, really. And the ruling, so far as we understand it, is that you have to do a full import declaration from the EU if there's a no deal or whenever we do get a deal. So it's, November, January next year, whatever the date is, they've gone out without anything, so they're coming back into the country. So once they cross customs territories, there has to be some sort of customs process. You, you can't, it's, it's black and white system. Uh, Duncan Bell from Autograph, um, sound equipment sales and rental business. Uh, it's a very similar question to just sort of expand on that same thing about existing equipment that's out there um, for Tom to, to pass up the chain uh, that I think it identifies a really big issue for existing productions that are out of the UK and will at some point come back. You know, as a rental company, by definition, our equipment comes back. Um, it will have left the country without any paperwork at all because it's free movement. Uh, some of those shows are out there for, you know, six months, 18 months, three years, five years, 10 years, whatever. Um, so, Two questions, really. Well, one, can that be fed back up as being a major issue that, that faces small businesses that just simply won't have the resources to, to pay those costs? So that there needs to be slightly more than a um, slightly vague, let's take a view on it at the time sort of approach to it, which is what I'm hearing at the moment. Um, I think the other thing is that we do a certain amount of stuff on carnets. What's the situation in terms of how you do that if you know it's going to be out for longer than a year? Is there, is there any long-term carnet mechanism, or is or, you know how does one how does one deal with that? So just on the first point, yeah, I mean this is something that we're really live to, and we have picked up a lot from the sort of theatre sector um, and orchestras, especially um, with their sort of long-form tours. Uh, so yeah, no, that your first point. That's something that, as I say, we're really live to, and we're sort of engaging in ongoing discussions with the relevant parts of government um, about coming up with a more satisfying answer. As is clear at the moment, there isn't one because part of the issue is that we we can't speak for the EU states. Um, what we are saying is. Um, to uh, check with uh, the sort of customs arrangements of the sort of EU as a whole and then the individual states within it, um, see what advice they're providing. But other than that, it's really difficult for sort of, the UK government to speak for, for the EU. On the Carney's question, I would defer to the London Chamber of Commerce. Um, on the uh, six year versus one year, what com I mean, the convention is absolutely clear that it is only for a year. So what companies have done in the past is come take, take them back and then take out a new uh, carne 
Uh, now that might not suit in uh, your, your, your case, but I'd have thought with, for that period of time, never mind the carne, that provided you can demonstrate that this is uh, for a particular purpose over a, a period, period of, of, of time, then you will either come to an arrangement whereby you may have to pay duty, um, I don't know, but, it, but to have certainty in it, um, it might be better not to use a carne. We are running out of time, so time for one final question, if there is one. There is one. Hi, I'm Kath from Sennheiser UK, and we basically import stuff from Germany into the UK. My question is, obviously, hi-fi equipment is on the lower scale of things coming into the UK. How far down the scale are we compared to, um, I don't know, medicine and things like that, as in how long will we be expected with everything in place, as in if we have all our paperwork, to go through the border? Because obviously we will be lower down the queue than, I don't know, fruit and veg or medicine. There is no, um, there's no priority on products as such, so it, 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 perishables aren't going to get priority in Operation Brock going out. Oh, and they won't be getting priority in the Cali area if they come again. So the, the, the queues will be one to thousands or maybe not. I mean, I know you're saying you're optimistic about the queues, but if you can imagine that this is going to happen next Friday, if there's 5,000 vehicles a day heading down to Dover, what percentage of those are going to be 100% correct in terms of paperwork? Well, you could say, well, optimistically, 90%. So that's 10% of those vehicles. That's hundreds of vehicles aren't going to be ready. And that will just escalate over the, over the days to follow. So and there's a problem on the other side as well, on the EU side. I mean, this is not just a UK problem. You've got all the EU 27 logistics companies and transport companies all basically begging us every day. So what do we do? What do we tell our members? How do we, how do we get stuff moving? I mean, there is a core of, of logistics companies and all, all the big names that you know. They are the ones who are going to be able to move goods in, in a day one situation because they work with the rest of the world. They understand all, all the systems. They've got software that sorts to HMRC. They have agents in Calais and every other European country in capital. So they can, they can, they can move freight. It's not, it, it's not there's no, no freight is going to be able to move. The problem is the legitimate freight, which is correctly... Um, I would say board already, if you like, in terms of paperwork, will probably get caught up behind the 10% or the 20% or 30% or even 40% of vehicles that are just taking a chance. But once it, the, the whole idea about Operation Brock is to keep vehicles away from the ports that aren't deemed board already, and the final check for the, if that vehicle is allowed to embark the ferry is a ferry company themselves. Now, that's not a full customs check. They're just looking for a certain uh, MRN numbers or an ATA carney that's being stamped and so on and so on. And the, and the, uh, the, the legal under, uh, terminology is it's, they have reasonable belief that the vehicle is ready to ship, and that's it. But of, so, so between Dartford uh, Bridge and Dover Docks, in those thousands of vehicles, if it comes to a real bad situation, there's going to be hundreds of those being turned around and sent back north to wherever to wait an indefinite amount of time until the problem is resolved, which is probably going to be going back to the, to the shippers in the first place. There's going to be a very um, strict regime that's going to be implemented in, in relation to this, um, so that if you don't have the, as we said, if you don't have the correct paperwork, you are going back to the back of the queue and indeed fixed penalties. Uh, of £300. In fact, I understand there's a regime for fixed penalties on the other side uh, in, 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 in France. Is that correct? Being in France, it's €1,000. Yes, it's €1,000 uh, on the other side if the paperwork isn't correct on, uh, uh, on that side. So uh, certainly Operation Brock will be very, uh, very heavily policed by DBSA, um, as we understand it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're out of time, unless there's just one final one, one very quick one. No? Okay, well, we, we are out of time on this. We need to move on. Um, in the meantime, it, it, I hope that you've um, had some of your questions answered satisfactory. Uh, I'm sure the guys will be hanging around for a while if you want to go and have a conversation with them during lunch. Um, but before we bring up the next panel, can you show your appreciation, please? Thanks very much.